I'm Chris McDonough, a retired homicide detective. I've interviewed thousands of people, from serial killers to ministers. Welcome to the interview room. So let's let's talk about then the drawings uh, as a whole. Um, help us understand why the why that's significant uh, to him and towards his signature as a whole or his mo. Well, he had been drawing for since he was a teenager, drawing these girl traps and you know girls in all different kinds of positions and imagining them tied to railroad tracks and trains running over them. I mean, he did a very elaborate one for me of a silo with multiple torture objects all over the place and including a train and a train track inside the silo <laughs> because the train was a really big deal to him to, to imagine like a Dudley do right scene where the train actually goes and kills Nell. And these were dreams that he had, fantasies that he had. Uh, if he'd hear a train whistle, he'd think about a girl on the track tied there. Um, so he had a lot of drawings like that. He had a lot of drawings of girls, young girls bound, um, blood coming out of them, stabbed, uh, strangled, hanged. Um, he just, and then he also cut out um, pictures from magazines and newspapers and, and draw things on them, gags and ropes and whatnot, because for him, binding was the most arousing thing that he said that it's the binding that matters in all of this. He, that has to be part of it. Mm -hmm. and, from, from, go ahead, from, my, from my perspective, in terms of the drawings, all that represents practice, curiosity, imagination, fantasy in anticipation and preparation to make, take it to the next level. First, it all starts in the mind when he commits it to paper. But it's more detailed. He can uh, experience a, a higher level of uh, projecting himself into that situation. And then it, it elevates his ability to uh, strengthen his level of uh, confidence to now go out and eventually and commit those crimes. And that's why you see those similarities between, as Dr. Ramsland has suggested, the details of those, those drawings. And then you take a look at the crime scenes. They just reflect that fantasy and what he's committed to paper. They do. I agree. He needed power over females because they made him feel off balance in a way that humiliated him. Did he ever explain to you, Dr. Ramsland, uh, what his issues uh, were and are with uh, females, particularly young females. Growing, going to school, he wasn't, he was a terrible student. Um, he felt awkward, but he was the oldest boy of four and had always felt kind of empowered by that. And he gets to school and suddenly he's, he's completely, you know, female teachers, make him feel stupid. Um, girls don't respond to him. He doesn't really know how to act around them. And all of a sudden this, this, you know, juvenile sense of, you know, I'm, I'm important. gets deflated entirely and not, mm -hmm. nobody's fault. It's his perception. Mm -hmm. 
it's his sense of what am I supposed to do with this? The only thing I know to do with this is to keep control over them, total control. And part of it came from a teacher. Part of it was from his mother, humiliating him in several instances. Um, and part of it was from a teacher who uh, he, he would spy on. And I think he had his first masturbation experience watching her while he had a rope around his, his uh, middle. And that was arousing because he felt like he had power over her by being able to see her and she didn't know he was out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that transferred when he began to break into things, like he broke into the school and he broke into houses and he felt powerful over people when he did that um, because they didn't, they didn't want, you know, they didn't invite him in, but he was able to get in. And the more he could do that, especially as became a person who, who puts in security systems, mm -hmm. um, it, it just gave him the confidence that, that females otherwise took away from him. Interesting. So quite, question, quite, go ahead. I was going to ask what, what led him then to, uh, in terms of ultimate power and control, that would include the power over life or death. Yes. Yeah. Um, interesting also with respect to the lack of sexual assault, as far as we know, with, with his female victims. But we know that it was sexually motivated. Um, where, where was the issue with respect to his inability, uh, either by preference or inability, uh, to perform sexually um, or to uh, have to masturbate? Well, he likes to say it's so that he's not violating his marriage vows, <laughs> so, which I think is amusing. Um, and I actually caught him out kind of in a lie with that because he, there was a customer once that he tried, he tried to seduce and wanted to have an affair with. And I said, well, isn't that sort of a violation of your marriage vows? I mean, so that doesn't really make sense that that's your reasoning why you did not sexually violate your victims. Um, so I think, I think when, when he was with his victims and had them bound, the, the sexual experience for him wasn't about being inserting himself. It was about be, having power over them. Yeah. And so masturbating next to them using a nightgown or something like that, um, was was just as fine as raping them, and I think he I think he does believe the fact that he did not rape anyone uh, that we know of um, gives him uh, you know some sort of special status in the murder world. So, question: What help us understand the psychological development up to his first kill? What, what was that trigger that pushed him over the edge and the Otero family were in the mark? So he will say it was getting fired from a job he really loved at Cessna. And all of a sudden his wife is the breadwinner, which made him feel awful. Um, and that was when he decided to start taking classes. He broke into homes that gave him a sense of power, uh, and then he decided to go for it. He, his, he had already had a lot of fantasies about following women. He had already tried to abduct the bank clerk. Um, I have a feeling that he had tried some things when he was overseas in the military that he hasn't actually admitted to, but he was carrying a hit kit uh, there. So I think the fantasies already had spilled over into some form of reality there that he hasn't yet talked about. Uh, and, and so I think, I think it was really anger, feeling helpless and powerless, and he just had enough uh, of a rehearsal fantasy going on that it was time. It was time. And then he saw um, the, the mother-daughter, the mother and um, Josephine Otero, Julie and Josephine, and they just were at the wrong place at the wrong time. And they also so, lived in a house that he thought was a perfect pl uh, placement. It was a corner house, had 
three in the in the address because threes are a big deal to him. Um, it was easy, easy uh, getaway kind of thing. So suddenly it became a very a real place, real people. He could. Uh, there was a fence around the backyard. He did not know they had a dog. Um, I don't know why, because it was January and there were dog, you know, dog marks all over the snow. But he didn't know that. He he likes to think of himself as somebody who left nothing to chance, but he left a lot of things to chance. In fact, so he's a, he's pretty limited in his actual self awareness. I think. Interesting. So when he his first uh, abduction attempt, uh, do you believe that the bank teller was the first? Uh, abduction attempt, or do you think, based on your comments, that his military development, there could be some others that we don't know about uh, in the front side of this? I, at least in terms of stalking and I mean, his first sexual experiences with, with women there, actually overseas. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of stalking, I think he did that. Why would you put together a hit kit if you're, if you're not? you know, carry it around. There were, he, he was in a place where there probably wouldn't be much accountability. Um, these are people who didn't really know him. So I think that, that certainly there are victims of something there, whether they're murder victims, I don't know, but I do think he did some things there. Do you think it's uh, is possible that he, was, uh, that he was introduced to the uh, bondage uh, it, with those first sexual experiences while he was in the military? No. The bondage came from a, being a, a kid, actually, mm -hmm. and playing with ropes and stuff when he was on the farm and feeling the the pleasurable experience of ropes. He would he would tie them around his waist and almost pass, and, and he would pass out from mm -hmm. uh, just lack of oxygen, but it was highly pleasurable to him. And also uh, one time he was bound with ropes of playing cowboys and Indians and trapped in a silo. And that, that while terrifying was also very arousing. So the, all of the fantasies of bondage really came from his early development. Oh, okay. Now that's yeah, really I'm interesting. Just, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's interesting because um, I had talked, we, we mentioned Vernon Gaberth earlier, um, who I think may have been consulted on, BTK when he was unknown and and um, I had said to him that I was very interested in in learning how sexually sadistic people over the centuries would have developed their fantasies prior to the wide availability of pornography uh, on the internet printed photography that you could be private with like snapshots with a Polaroid or whatever and what he had said at the time was that he thought they might have been doing a lot of drawing or maybe even model making or something, but there, but there must have been some way that they played out visually these fantasies. And um, I wonder how much Raider talks about using drawings as a way of developing those fantasies and the rehearsal way that was talked about. And the other thing that I wonder about, because there's an assumption going on, I think, and we see it all over the media right now, that the people depicted in the drawings must be real victims that there's a correspondence to real vi and i can't help but wonder based on other artwork of serial killers that i've seen if they aren't simply fantasy people that aren't actually human beings out in the world um so i wonder what your thoughts are on that uh, i haven't heard anybody opine one way or the other on it well i'll tell you a funny story about uh Vern Eberth. <laughs> he told me once that uh dennis raider had one of my books in his collection he yelled it across the room at me in front of a lot of people. And it turned out during the sentencing hearing, in fact, he had one of my books. And I didn't get a royalty because he stole my book. <laughs> so, but it was a book about forensic psychology for writers. So I certainly didn't teach him much of anything. Um, and I thought that was amusing that that uh, Byrne noticed my book among the stash of things that the that have been collected from his house. Um, I think it really depends, Gary, your, uh, your question, I think it depends on the killer, because I think we believe Gerard Schaefer's drawings do depict quite a few of his victims that were that we haven't been able to link to him. And I and I think that's, that goes without saying when you look at some of those drawings, it, probably some of that was real. 
Uh, I think with Raider, he certainly drew some of his actual victims, but he has so many drawings uh, prior to the murders and during the murders that really aren't about um, anyone. Uh, and I think it's I think it is really odd to kind of watch how people are kind of sorting through his drawings and going, oh, this looks like that missing person. But it's a drawing. How are you going to be able to really make the case for that unless unless the drawing is wearing something really unique that that person had on when they went missing? Um, I think I think some of that is getting a, a, a little bit just going too far. And you guys can talk to that because you're the investigators. But I've been a little surprised by some of that. I mean, point is being made that there's something special about the color drawings. But I have several drawings that were done by Raider, and they're all in color. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I heard someone say that, for example, it's possible that the color drawings suggest more emotion and therefore they may be real victim. I think he just is that's just his style when he draws. And, and, and some of them are in color and some are. I don't know if I would ascribe meaning to them being in color. All of his uh, letters have drawings to me in color. Uh, he likes color, and many, many of the drawings are in color. Uh, lots of them with red blood, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's not uncommon for sexual sadistic uh, personalities, right? I mean, I've, I've seen many cases where the fantasy drawings, you know, are played out, and then, of course, you know, the, the crime occurs itself. But So it's not unique to Dennis Rader that he's making these drawings. Uh, I mean, there, and there was well, a guy, I think in New Mexico, New Mexico that was doing it. Go ahead, Greg. I was going to say, I agree. I, it makes it more real, doesn't it? In color, in living color, so yeah. to speak. Uh, so you add color yeah. to it. It makes he it. He put names on them. Living. He would take them for rides in his truck. They got to go on, a, on an mm -hmm. outing with them when he went to work, Monique and Andrea, and he, they were real to him. Yeah. So he, he was living this dual fantasy secret life. Uh, and yet, how what, what's the significance of the number three? Why is that so important to him? It's magic. <laughs> it's, he just <laughs> seemed to notice a pattern in his life of threes coming up. Like he had, you know, two childhood friends. So that was three. He had, uh, I guess, three girlfriends. He had uh, many of the victims' addresses have three or, mul or multiples of three. Um, he had, had a very long, elaborate page full of the number three and how it figures into his life. Um, and he just found that to be significant. Like, you know, it's a pattern. He sees it as a, a pattern that is somehow protective for him. Interesting. How, how did he project his girlfriends? Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. McCullough. Oh, I'm sorry, Chris. I was just going to say, in one of the things that I have from Raider, there's a sort of a seal that he created, and it looks like the number three is turned on its side to look like breasts. Yeah. And um, I don't know if that's if how that figures into things, but but are you, I'm sure, Catherine, you're familiar with this drawing oh, yeah. that he does with the three turned on the side. Do you, the do you think that that experience of the coupling of the of the terrorizing experience uh the sexual experience when he's young projects all the way forward to him getting involved in in these sexually sadistic activities with his victims uh where does the sadism sadism come from otherwise i i think the sadism comes from his own masochism and I know that we find this a lot in people, where both of those impulses happen in the same person. He would bury himself, he would wrap himself, he would hang himself, he would do all kinds of things to himself. Um, and it's almost like he wanted to experience being a victim, being under someone's control uh, when he was doing that for his autoerotic episodes and his motel parties and you know whatever he called them. And then he would transfer that to be the person doing this to someone else. But but there was always a sense of like he would take things from them and then wear those things mm -hmm. in his autoerotic, like slips. Uh, he particularly like women's slips. Um, 
trying to almost recreate what the terror they must have felt when he was in the room. Um, there was one suggestion that he had told, uh, I think it was Catherine Bright, you know, the BTK killer. He has denied that. But I think he, he may well have done that because mm -hmm. the psychological torture. I mean, he didn't spend long enough time. I mean, I, all of us here know about the torture people and you know, sure. keeping victims alive to do right. things over and over to them. He didn't do that. The torture for him was more psychological. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the fear, the, the sense of power he had over them. He'd see it. He wanted to replicate. So Harvey Glattman was sort of a role model for him. And Glattman had taken, who was a photographer or posed as one anyway, mm -hmm. taken pictures of, of these young women after he talked them into letting him bind them. And the look of terror on their face that he captured in his photos imprinted on Dennis when he was 14. He, he got a hold of one of these magazines, true crime, two detective magazines with with those photos as the cover feature. And he wanted to replicate that look because in his mind as a teenager, that's the power over women I want to experience. Mm -hmm. So each victim would have been subjected to something that would have brought out for him that look. The, the, from an investigative aspect, you know, my brain is going a thousand miles an hour. So from that moment, when did he, when did he, his, his drawing fantasies really start to take off? Do, do you have insight into during, that? During his adolescence, he was drawing some of these things on the board while other kids were going out to recess. He was drawing girl traps and, and imagining wow. Annette Funicello in the, in the girl trap and, he would watch Dudley do right cartoons and and imagine, you know, Nell on the train tracks and the train would run over her. So these are all things that he was indulging in in his adolescence. It's wow. interesting. And he that took he, that into the military. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, it's it's interesting that he fantasizes about uh, their demise rather than rescuing them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was just going to ask, uh, it must be interesting being female, interacting with Peter. Has he ever voiced any outrageous kind of perverse ideas or been condescending or anything? Or, or do you seem to represent a kind of idealized female figure who, you know, where he would never harm a hair on your head kind of a thing? Uh, it's interesting to think about why he's able to open up to you so uniquely. So I have the added status of being a professional um, because I know that with other women correspondents, other female correspondents, he has mm -hmm. gone over the line with them. Um, but mm -hmm. never really never with me. We've had I've confronted him about some things that you know I found that he was lying about or you know saying odd things about. But we've had a fairly respectful relationship. Even even if he I I have a set schedule when he can call me and if he has to break it for some reason he's very apologetic um whereas i've heard of other people who who have these arrangements with serial killers who get calls in the middle of the night and um, a lot of violation of boundaries um raider really has never done that with me and we've known each other a long time at this point um i i think he respects me but also i was his opportunity this is his shot Right. This is oh, the way to get his story out there, because I wasn't just a psychology professional. I was a writer. And I think right. that was a very big deal to him. But I but I will say the irony was this. The first thing he wanted me to do was was uh, learn codes and participate in his game. So fine. You know, I'm I'm up for that because I'm looking for behavior of any kind that he wants to display. So um, we were going to do this whole project through codes in part because he didn't want the guards to know what was going on, but also because it's his game. It's his spy game. And in the end, he kept forgetting his code. So I ended up making the code that we used, meaning I had the power. <laughs> so, so he doesn't want to be powerless to a female, but in the end, that's exactly how it happened.
Hard working every day I'm stressed out 24-7, babe No, no timeouts Wish we could fly away You and I Go to our favorite place Oh, yeah, yeah Make special memories Together I'll be your company Now and forever Taking away, yeah, we're taking away. We'll never.